Sunday school here at church. That's exciting. You're going to hang out with your teachers and do cool things and learn some cool stuff. Don't... All right. Ready to start worship? You know what we're going to do? I'm going to read some scripture. I'm going to pour some water and we're going to start. This is from the book of Exodus. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? Amen. It is wonderful to have you back on that organ this Sunday. Friends, grace to you in peace and welcome to worship here at Edgewood Presbyterian Church. A special welcome to those of you who are watching at home on Zoom or later on YouTube. You are here with us. We feel your presence. 
Y'all, if someone asked me for one sentence that sums up the hopes and the dreams of Edgewood Presbyterian Church, I think I would offer this. You are welcome here. Not welcome to become like us, not welcome pending approval, simply and humbly welcome in the name of Christ. Whether you have been here many, many times before, or if this is your first time in this sanctuary, we are a different congregation because you are here. Welcome. I invite you to please now rise in body or spirit and join Kevin in the responsive call to worship. We have gathered in God's holy presence, the one who etches grace on our hearts. We ask God to transform us into disciples. We glorify our God who yearns for justice and just not just for a favored few, but for the least of our world. We yearn for the spirit to write compassion on our souls. We give thanks to God for unceasing grace we remember Christ's persistence in seeking us. Holy God, breathe your word of life into us. Let us pray. God, our source and our salvation, in love you made us, and by love you have redeemed us. Make your love for us bear fruit in our forgiveness of others, that in this life, we may know your all-embracing compassion, and in the world to come, receive the everlasting joy of the fellowship you share with your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Beloved, we have come here with burdens too great to bear alone. We have come here seeking authenticity and honesty and to join in the redemption of a world that is groaning. And so we humbly offer our own truth to the God of everlasting love. Let us join our voices together now in a prayer confessing our brokenness. God of mercy, we struggle to understand the mercy you give. We hold on to bitterness. We grip our anger tightly. Even more, we cling to our own shame. Fill our hearts with mercy. Teach us forgiveness. Show us the way of Christ. Listen to our hearts as we pray to you in silence.
Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our God says, I have swept away your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Listen so that you may live. The steadfast love of the Lord never fails. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and restored to new life. Let us pray. Eternal God of wisdom, from generation to generation, you teach your people the way to live. Through words that are ancient, you speak your living word. Speak to us now with all that we need to honor you and walk in your way with honesty and humbleness of heart. Amen. Psalm 103 is a meditation on God's goodness and forgiving love. Please join me in reading these verses responsibly. Lord, you are full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You will always accuse us, nor will you keep your anger forever. You have not dealt with us according to our sins, nor repaid us according to our iniquities. And the heavens are as high above, so great is your steadfast love for those who stand in awe of you. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. A loving parent has compassion for their children. So you have compassion for those who fear you. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. We are in the Gospel of Matthew again. Last week, we heard a chunk of verses just before today's reading. We heard Jesus teaching the disciples about how to handle conflict in the church. We're going to back up three verses into last week's reading to set up this next lesson, Jesus's lesson about forgiveness. Friends, listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among you. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, 
have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel for the people of God. Praise to you, O Christ. A sermon about forgiveness is not as angst-ridden for a congregation as a sermon about money, but it's more stressful than one about love. Forgiveness is tricky and we know we're supposed to do it and it's one of those things we really struggle to deal with. I invite you for the next few minutes to steer into that curve instead of turning away from it though. Let's deal with this forgiveness stuff. Each of us has a forgiveness situation under our fingernails. There is someone from whom we are aching to receive forgiveness. Or, or there is someone who needs our forgiveness but we haven't decided to give it yet. After all, it's fresh. It's only been a few days or months or a few years. Or maybe our tummies hold a memory, the memory of what it was like to be forgiven, to be forgiven that thing, that thing that we hope no one will ever make us speak aloud again. Maybe your tummies remember that. I'm not going to ask you to speak it aloud, but I am going to ask you to feel it. Just for a moment. Can you feel the forgiveness that you have sought or the forgiveness that you're seeking? I carry that in my shoulders. Or can you feel the forgiveness that you have given or have withheld? I carry that in my chest. Forgiveness, the, the release, the loosening, the removal of the heaviness. Do you remember it? When you have been forgiven, when you've been forgiven for something you thought might stick with you forever, it is a sensation of relief that you feel in your skin and in your ears and in your, in your limbs as they move more lightly, more freely, like the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz when the oil can unlocks his joints. Receiving or giving forgiveness, it's a physical experience. It can be euphoric. It's a high, and it's costly. My own personal list of people that I need to forgive, but haven't, includes, but is not limited to, a fellow pastor in Birmingham, the new garbage service for the city of Homewood, 
my uncle, a seminary professor, my best friend's father, a student I know who lives in Nashville, a truck driver on Highway 31 whose name I don't know, the nurse at my dermatologist's office, Governor Kay Ivey, and myself. We know that forgiveness is a big deal for Jesus. He doesn't leave much up to the imagination here with this terrifying parable. He gives clear instructions about conflict and then how forgiveness should be a routine thing. He describes how God's reign is built on an overflowing river of mercy from on high. Mercy that overwhelms us and causes us, us to give our own mercy whenever we can. This is the kingdom of God. And yet we have this tendency, right? This tendency to hold on, to hold on to our anger, our betrayal, our offense, our shame, even as Christ tells us that what we bind here will follow us. He tells us to let go of our hurt, to loose it. He knows and we know that doing so will bring relief and lightness and freedom. Peter thinks he's being audacious with his bid of seven times. And Peter doesn't yet understand the commitment to grace that God actually has in mind. And we're with him. We are looking for the terms and conditions here. Maybe, like me, you immediately hear, you hear this story, this passage, and you immediately try to think of as many horrible, unforgivable things as possible. Maybe you try to build the most extreme example and wonder if God really would have us forgive such a thing. It's a game we're playing because if we're talking about that horrible, horrible thing, then we can run out the clock and not have to talk about the smaller but still heavy things that we're all holding on to. We are stingy with our forgiveness and we find it hard to come by from others because it is hard work. Working up the energy to forgive someone even just once can be exhausting. At least if it's true forgiveness that we're talking about. Because that means accepting imperfection and messiness in our lives. It means having to live with a relationship that isn't pristine anymore. Sometimes it feels like it would be better, it would feel better to not have the relationship at all than for us to concede that we can't fix them or ourselves or the way we relate. We can't make everything the way it should be. They are not who we need them to be to please us. And we are not God. And that is a tough concession to make some days. Forgiveness is hard work. And it asks us to be vulnerable. The time that we have spent with our neighbors at Homewood Union Missionary Baptist Church, working on race and racism, that time's been really fun and wonderful. And exhausting. And we haven't done anything together in quite a while now. Just a few weeks ago, our presbytery had an anti-racism event. And the power of the conversations that day, the lessons from that day, and the incredible awkwardness of that day linger in my jaw, caught between a smile and a cringe between a song and the biting of my tongue. We hold on to anger 
and shame and bitterness and righteous rage because they are predictable. We know how they work and we know how to work with them. Sure, this God promises a better way, but these tools, anger, shame, bitterness, righteous rage, these tools have served us well enough, haven't they? Outrage is a powerful currency in our culture. Outrage gets us attention. And the public is so wildly poor at discerning genuine injustice from life being a tad bit difficult sometimes. And the most cynical among us are masters at manufacturing outrage to distract from a world crying out in genuine suffering. And God, by the way, does outrage very, very well through the voices of, of prophets and apostles and a Messiah. God's outrage is mainly upset when we worship wealth and empire and status and when we neglect the needs of our neighbors when they are hungry and vulnerable then we're going to get some outrage. It turns out that the breaking of our end of God's covenant is what pierces God's heart. But even then, even then, there is an invitation to forgiveness. Forgiveness is not passive or, or weak. Forgiveness, and we know this, forgiveness is bold. It's a holy response to brokenness. It's a remarkable thing that we can do to heal a relationship, to heal ourselves. That's miraculous. We get to use our incredibly evolved brains to make a choice to open our spirit marinated hearts and to not give up on one another. And we do this not forgetting what happened, forgive and forget, throw that away. We do this not forgetting what happened, but quite the opposite, actually. We forgive fully knowing what they and we are capable of doing to one another. And so we might handle things differently next time. Forgiveness doesn't mean letting someone treat us poorly again and again. That would be failing to give forgiveness its sacredness and reducing it to a, a delete button. It's important to state clearly that along with forgiving, not being connected to forgetting, forgiving does not always mean restoration of the relationship. And I have to say this because of the church. The church has been the lead offender in telling people through the, through the ages telling people who have been abused that they must remain in relationship with an abuser. Saying that to people itself is abuse and violence that the church has committed. Abuse and violence, which it needs to confess and to seek forgiveness for, from God and from those we have hurt. Now, forgiveness may, of course, be deeply healing and allowing someone to, someone who suffered to find new life and Forgiveness might be helpful for a repentant abuser to find a path forward, but that doesn't mean that they should move forward together. Forgiveness is resistance. It is breaking the hold of vengeance, of returning evil for evil. Forgiveness is courageous and compassionate. It's a holy declaration that the worst words any of us say when we are at our worst, those words do not define us. Forgiveness is the sacred vow that the ways that we hurt each other, one-to-one, -one, people to people, nation to nation, the ways we hurt each other are not the last words on whether God's dream of freedom will be realized. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven.
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's right there. Jesus slipped forgiveness into the prayer that he gave us. He did that knowing that whether we are sinners or debtors or, tr or trespassers, we would be asking for forgiveness and promising it every time we gather. Y'all, I could tell you right now that we should all go out into the world with an abundance of forgiveness and that it will make a real difference in our lives and the lives of others. And I would be correct. So let's do that. And we know that we will fall short because again, forgiveness is hard and it asks so much of us. And that seminary professor on my list has this just really annoying face. And so we will gather here again and ask forgiveness for not doing what Jesus tells us to do. And we will ask God's help in being more forgiving going forward. And we will receive the forgiveness we seek, thanks be to God. But look at your fingernails for a second. Let your body recall the forgiveness situation we squirmed about a few minutes ago. Let your body remember also the release, the relief, the loosing, the unburdening, the unbinding that you called to mind when you thought about forgiveness being practiced. Your miraculous brain, your beautiful heart, your courageous guts, you have a choice. Thanks be to God. Amen.
In the gospel according to John, our Lord says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Let us all now share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. As we're finding our seats, I'll remind you that we are receiving prayer requests both by uh, the texting option on the back of your worship folder or by the prayer cards found in your pews. And Amy Crow, I think I'm going to put you back to work again. If you have a prayer request that you have written on a card, wave it up high in the next couple minutes and Amy will collect those um, and we will share them toward the end of the service. But you can also use the texting option and we will share those as well. Please find the fellowship pads that are on the center aisle side of your pew. Let us know you were here and how to, pay, how to be in touch and pass them to your neighbor so that they end up over by those stained glass windows. All right. Uh, after worship today, a couple of notes. First, outside on the table uh, in the hallway just out here, there is a card. And this is not from someone you know. This is a project of Kathy Sylvie. Uh, for a man named Gary from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, who is a Vietnam vet doing an honor flight to the Vietnam uh, Memorial in Washington, D.C. in October. And uh, Kathy and friends are gathering cards for this gentleman. Uh, so if you have a chance, please stop and sign your name and send Gary a get well, uh, a, not a get well, a, a happy voyage message on his way to D.C. Um, in October. On that note, uh, Kathy and I are working on plans for uh, an offering for Veterans Day coming up in November, so keep your ears and eyes open for that. That was something we did before the pandemic that we'd like to bring back. After worship, we have Sunday school, y'all. Our uh, younger elementary and older elementary kids will gather and they will sing and then they uh, will have their class lessons. The older elementary kids are coming with me into the sanctuary and we're going to do a four week series on worship. Um, it, we're going to answer all their questions. We're going to look at all the stuff. We're going to make sure they understand what's happening here um, and uh, get all their questions answered. It's going to be a blast. This evening from five to seven, BYG, Birmingham Presbyterian Birmingham Youth Group gathers at Southminster in the lower level at Southminster. Um, we are now we're getting into gear. We've had our sort of opening stuff and now we're gonna start our lessons uh, carrying through the fall. Our theme for this year, if you haven't heard it 15 times is puzzling faith, prophets, prayers and parables. So we're gonna talk about the prophets tonight. It's gonna be fun and we'll have dinner. A reminder that we are going to need some dinners coming up, so if you'd like to help with that, please uh, talk to me. This week, we have uh, all our normal fall stuff happening. Wednesday night, we have uh, handbells and dinner and choir, and then on Friday, we have our men's Bible study that got off to a good start uh, this past Friday at 7 a.m. Coming up this Saturday, if you haven't registered for this yet, you should. We'll include the link in the weekly email. It is the uh, NAMI Birmingham Walk, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Uh, this has become sort of an Edgewood tradition over the last five or six years, four or five years, I don't know. It's a walk in Railroad Park. You register, you get a t-shirt, it's a fundraiser for NAMI, and then the group of us, whoever's around, sometimes we go get brunch afterwards or uh, enjoy the park. Saturday morning, 
Uh, registration starts at 845. If you have questions, you can talk to Ann Ray or uh, click on the link in the weekly email. All right, you know what's coming up. That last weekend of September, the art has already started pouring in. We have some beautiful posters that Rick Frenet has prepared that will be out and about in the neighborhood and here at the church. First light, second light, more light, our big art fundraiser. Um, this started last year as the uh, creative genius of Cedric uh, Jr., Cedric Castro Jr., and we're continuing it this year. 10% of proceeds will go to the First Light Shelter downtown. The rest is so that we can put in some new lights upstairs in Barron Hall and make it bright and nice and visible in there. Um, that last weekend, the schedule is on the posters. There's stuff Friday night, uh, twice on Saturday, and then a very special live auction piece on Sunday after worship. I want to give you a heads up about something that's coming up in October. I normally wouldn't do this right now, but I want to get it on your radar. October 22nd, if you have used the restroom at Edgewood, you have seen a poster about this. Um, October 22nd, that's in, you know, a month. Um, October 22nd is Fall River Fest at Living River. This is a big deal. Living River's trying to have more than just a, a, a Saturday, a, a Sunday afternoon gathering, but a real full on party to enjoy that space, celebrate what happens there, get people to explore it and make connection to Living River. Part of that Fall River Fest, and there are schedules posted throughout the building. There's fishing, there's canoeing, there's kayaking, there's hiking, there's crafts, there's uh, a craft fair, there's all sorts of fun stuff happening. Part of that day is worship. There will be worship at one o'clock, and a bunch of the churches from the presbytery who are sending folks are going to gather for that worship at one o'clock. And we have joined a few other churches in saying that that service at one o'clock at Living River on October 22nd will be our worship service that Sunday. So you are invited to take a look at that schedule. We'll make sure it's included in everything and decide what part of the day you want to be there for. You wanna be there from 8.30 to 7.30, that's when there's programming. Come and spend the whole day there. If you want to just be there for a portion of the day, uh, that's great too. But know that that worship service at one will be our Edgewood worship service. Now, if you are someone who is never gonna go to Living River, uh, fear not. The worship committee is working on what we will offer as an online option, um, something probably pre-recorded that will be available for those who just need a little bit of Edgewood on Sunday morning. Um, but more on that as we get closer. There's so much happening in the next couple of months. It's really, really exciting. Good stuff. Uh, I'll back up and remind you that Sunday, October 1st at 3 p.m. is the closing worship service at Second Presbyterian Church. And it would be wonderful if we had a nice showing from Edgewood there. Our choir will be uh, participating in the worship service that afternoon. And those folks at Second will be here that morning uh, for worship with us at 10. All right, that's a lot of announcements. Friends, our ushers are about to come forward to receive the offering. There's also an offering box in the back of the sanctuary. And of course, you can give online using the information on the back of your worship folder. Heaven and earth are yours, O Lord and of your own we give to you.
Friends, after the bread has been broken and the cup has been poured, I will invite you to come down by the center aisle to join in this feast, which is prepared. Um, the, uh, please take from the common loaf tear a piece of bread and move to the stations where the elders have the two cups, the blue with grape juice, the brown cup with wine. Dip your bread into the cup of your choice and then partake of the elements as you return via the side aisles. To your far left, there's a uh, contact free station for those who require that. And to the far right, Grace will have the uh, gluten free option for those who require that. The end of uh, when, the, when the choir has come through, if there's anyone who has not been served, please flag us down, wave your hand, and we will bring the elements to you. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to them, and suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. We seek to recognize Christ in one another and in ourselves here at this table, at this feast, in this bread, and in this cup. You are invited to this table. This table is not Edgewood's table. It is not a Presbyterian table, but this is Christ's table there is no barrier to you coming to this feast. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God.
Praise to you, O God, for all your works. You created the world and called it good and made us in your image to live together in love. You made a covenant with us, and even when we turned from you, you remained ever faithful. Therefore, we join with heavenly choirs and the faithful of every time and place as the people say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, O God, and blessed is your son, Jesus. You sent him to us as a child, a child in Palestine, a brown-skinned child, the child of a teenage mom, a Jewish child, a poor child, a child born under the thumb of an emperor. He was a refugee. His family worked with their hands. He broke bread with the unclean, the poor, the cast out, the marginalized, the broken, and the brokenhearted. He was ordered to die by the government in conspiracy with religious leaders, but death could not hold him. The tomb could not contain him. Together, O oh God, we are his resurrection people, and we are resilient. Remembering your goodness and grace, O oh God, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. Make us one in the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let your word bear good fruit in our lives so that we might be a blessing to others and bring honor and glory to your name. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God now and forever. And now with the boldness of the children of God, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us in whatever language or version speaks to our heart, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving grace of our Lord until he comes. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Come now to the welcome table.
As we continue in prayer, we lift up the needs of this community. We continue to pray for Don Hagen, who is doing well, but very immobile. And uh, Don says he would love your texts or emails. He's not quite ready for visitors yet, but um, healing up slowly but surely, long road ahead. We continue to pray for Mary Brooks. Um, still trying to figure out what's going on with Mary Brooks and a gallstone. And we pray for uh, the Reverend Rachel Winter. Enjoy for her installation last Sunday at Oakmont Chapel Presbyterian Church and for healing as she uh, deals with this broken leg and ligament issues. Amy Crow asks us to pray for her godson, Dalen, who is in the hospital. Amy, we certainly pray for Dalen. And Patty Winter asks us to pray for Rachel. Surgery uh, and broke, surgery for the ligaments and broken bone in the left knee. Uh, and that's coming up this week. Is that right, Patty? Yeah. All right. Tuesday? Wednesday. Thank you. Yes. And then Amanda Klimko asks us to pray for her friend, Kim, with a recent stage four melanoma diagnosis. And we hold Kim in our prayers for dealing with that in all the ways and for the care of doctors. Friends, with these prayers and the prayers that remain in the recesses of our hearts, we pray together your response to Lord in your mercy is hear our prayer. God of grace, we have approached you with humility. We have told you of the holy grief in our own lives and in our life together. We have received forgiveness. We have pondered your word and broken bread together. We have sung and prayed and opened our souls to your presence, sharing with this community our fears, our worries, and our joys. And we place it all before you. O oh God, know the stirrings of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, we look around and all we see is brokenness. All we see is disease and suffering and injustice. All we see is fear and anger. Help us not to turn away. For the disease is severe and the suffering is real and the injustice is profound and the fear and anger are simply part of us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us, O oh God, to turn to you that we might see more. Show us how we can be helpers and builders and creators of justice and comforters of the bereaved and bringers of peace and speakers of truth and witnesses to brokenness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, show us that good outlasts evil that grace overcomes bitterness, that hope is greater than despair, and that love brings life that stands when death has fallen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray to you, O God, in the name of Christ, our salvation. Amen. Thank you. 
to please be seated for one more moment while the kids join me for the Sermon from the Steps. Here's Oliver and Carter and Harrison and Karana and Clara and Cameron. Excellent. All right. All right. Looking good. Oh, there he is. Hey, Coop. Um, so today is the start of a new school year at church, and I think I said that last week too. We like new year stuff. How many of you have ever stayed up till midnight on New Year's Eve? Have you? Have you? I don't, I used to, and now I don't make it anymore hardly. Um, we have New Year's Eve that's coming up in a few months at the end of December, and then we'll be moving from 2023 into 2024. We have the new school year that started a few weeks ago for y'all. We had the blessing of the backpacks. Then we had the start of the school year for Sunday school. And in a few weeks, uh, well, like 10 weeks or so, we're going to have Advent. And it'll be the start of the church year, another new year. Why do we have so many New Year celebrations? I think it's because we like the new chance to do a new thing. When the new year comes, we say we're going to do it different this year. We're going to have an awesome Sunday school year, even more awesome than last year. We're going to try to do things better. We're going to be better to our friends. We're going to be better to our families. We're going to be better to our church and our people and the people that we love. What's your question, Oliver? There is Sunday school today. Yes, it's the first day of Sunday school. It's going to be very exciting. Yeah, Oliver's excited. We get excited about New Year's because it gives us a new chance. Our scripture today taught us that we, when, guys, can you listen? When we need a new chance, there's always a chance for a new chance. God is not going to give up on us. God is never going to run out of forgiveness and love for us. Jesus says, forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. Now, I bet you're wondering what's in the bag. Yeah, I thought so. So I mentioned a whole bunch of different New Year's. This weekend is the new year for, all, I bet some of us have friends who are Jewish. In fact, I know you all have at least one friend who's Jewish, Miss Rose. And for our Jewish friends, their new year is this weekend. It's called Rosh Hashanah. Has anybody heard of Rosh Hashanah? That's a, he that's a Hebrew phrase, and it means new year, the start of the year. And it's a big celebratory weekend. And so I thought we could have a gift for Miss Rose for Rosh Hashanah and wish her a happy new year. What do you think? Should we do that? Yes. Now, I brought a very specific gift. Does anybody know what this is? It is an apple. There are four apples in here. And does anyone know what this is? Honey, that's right. These are very traditional things in uh, Jewish households to celebrate the new year. Now, do you know what honey and apples have in common? They are sweet. And so um, a lot of our friends, they slice up the apples and they dip it in the honey and they say, happy new year, have a happy and sweet New Year. So do you think we should wish Miss Rose a happy and sweet New Year? Yeah. All right, Cooper, Cooper Bratton, I'm going to trust you after worship, not now, but after worship, at the end, we're going to march down the aisle and you are going to bring this and whoever wants to join Cooper, bring it straight to Miss Rose and give it to her. And what are you going to wish her? A happy and sweet New Year. All right. Can you hold that? All right. Will you all pray with me? Let's pray. Dear God, happy New Year. We love new years. We love a fresh start. Thank you for forgiveness, for love, and new things. You love us, and we love you. Amen. All right, y'all, let's stand up. I'm going to bless the congregation and charge the congregation. We'll have the congregation rise in body or spirit. And then I'm going to walk to the back and y'all are going to follow me, but you're going to keep going and go give, bring that gift to Miss Rose. Sound good? Yes. yes. We're all on the same page. Excellent. 
Friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Alleluia. Oh.